religion usually comes out of a desire to reach order. Your world is chaos and you seek to establish order. You want things to be under control. I would say that there are two typical situations. Either you are, either there is no state, or you disagree with the current state. N notice how many religions have sprung out of a minority, have started as a the beliefs of a minority. Now, the first case with there not being a state, this it I suppose it depends on how broad your definition of the term state is, but this is basically the case for both the primitive religions and the the more recent ones, I suppose, the, the ones that have come into contact with more people. You know, basically, a primitive religion, basically the people are in a certain place, and they're not really moving, they're not really coming into contact with a lot of other people, you know, or at least they aren't forming long-standing relationships with the people of... Yeah, that doesn't entirely work either, but I'm hoping you know what I mean. Basically, in both cases, there are some things that the people don't understand, and they seek to explain it, and their explanations are the basis of the religion. Because the explanations create order or a sense that there will be order. This is why the Mayans sacrifice someone so that the sun would go up. I I think I have that right, otherwise it was some other religion, my point remains the same. It was because they feared that if they did not do what the religion said, everything would, you know, something bad would happen. So it is an attempt to create some order. It is motivated by fear, and usually also ignorance. Now, Ignorance, the word ignorance, tends to have a very negative connotation. I'm using it completely neutrally here. I'm not saying that the people who create a religion, they're being ignorant that that was, like, their own fault or something. I'm just saying they didn't know everything. They didn't know enough to make more re realistic guesses about what, how the world worked. And thus religion has this grip on people that, you know, people will tend to try to follow. There, there are often, you know, some forms of, I don't want to use the word punishment, but there are consequences to breaking the rules. Some of these are punishment, and some of them are because if you break the rule, you might be... I don't think I can really explain this without explaining the concepts of mana and taboo rules. Basically, mana, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I've never had to say that word in English, is the idea that there are some 
specific energy to basically all things and that you cannot the, the mana must be kept separate from things with a different kind of mana like you might not be allowed to touch the chief of your village or whatever because he has a lot of mana because he's and he has different mana than you so you know there are stories where people have come from the outside to primitive tribes and they've accidentally touched something that they weren't allowed to and they might have gotten killed for it and this is not because you know these primitive tribes were evil or something ridiculous like that. No, it's because their idea of it was that you weren't allowed to. And, you know, maybe you had to be killed. Maybe there was some risk of the mana being, you know, transferred to elsewhere if you lived and touched something else. It's really no different from rules of you know, religions that have more contact with the rest of the world and, you know, various other religions in general. You know, they all have certain rules that you have to follow or there will be certain consequences. You know, originally, the monotheistic religions, you could get killed for something that really isn't that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. But one problem that arises with these religions is that they make their rules and ideas holy and unapproachable. You cannot challenge them. And in many of the religions, it is simply because of this very strong, very ingrained fear that if you do not follow the religion, something very bad will happen. Not might, but will. And so, very little changes in societies that follow religion and you know in in that kind of I guess you could use the word fundamental in that fundamental of a way and basically everything has to be able to be challenged there shouldn't be anything that you can't challenge that you can't question because if it if it actually makes sense, it will hold up to the question. Ask as many questions, as many critical questions about democracy as you want, and you'll still, you know, come to the conclusion eventually, unless you're biased, that it is the best alternative of the different ways of ruling that we have try it thus far. It doesn't mean that it won't, you know, it might someday be changed to something else, or, you know, democracy is also growing. You know, democracy now is not what it was a couple of hundred years ago, and it's far away from, you know, the ancient Greek democracy. I'd like to point out that democracy, the word, means rule of the people, and yet in ancient Greece, I believe it was about 10% of the people. You had to be, I think, over 25, you had to not be a slave, not be a woman, own your own land, I th there are various things. I might be getting some of this wrong, not a great history scholar. Anyway, if you can't question, if you aren't allowed to question it, then 
bad things might happen in its name. There is nothing, I don't consider anything to be holy. There is nothing that you couldn't challenge to me that, heck, I, I challenge you to challenge that. I, I encourage you to think of anything that you, where you can ask a critical question and, you know, and I accept something without having actual proof or strong reason to believe. I question everything. I don't accept anything without carefully having questioned it and having considered the alternatives. And basically, that's how things improve, because what you, what you reach right now from critically asking questions might not be the best ever, but it's the best you can do right now. And it might inspire, you know, really exploring what this particular aspect is and what, you know, like the idea of human rights, you know, there wasn't always something called human rights. And it's because people were challenging, people were saying, wait, why do these people not get the same benefits as these other people? You know, we used to have kings, we used to have someone that you basically couldn't you know, that would just rule them. They could do whatever the heck they wanted. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that democracy as it is is perfect and that there aren't sometimes people doing really ridiculous crap in spite of having been democratically elected. But, like I said, you know, it isn't perfect, but it is the best we've, you know, thought up thus far. You know, not asking questions keeps the bad institutions going. And it might actually let the good institutions die if they might need aid, and because this hasn't already been decided, then they don't get it. Whereas, if you're asking questions and you see, hey, this organization is actually doing a lot of good, but it needs some support from the outside now. We can expect that it will do good enough that it can later, you know, repay. But right now it needs support, so, you know, let's give it to them. I think that's it for this one. Hold on, there was one more thing. The thing is about something being considered holy. Certainty is almost never reached. We can basically get really, really close to the truth and say, well, it isn't this, it isn't that. It could be this, so let's save that for later. It's not this. You know, eventually we'll have a very small amount of options and pretty much be left with maybe just one that makes the most sense, one that we can't quite disprove yet. So making something beyond reproach, making, making it impossible to question any one thing means it, it, there isn't a basis for it. Because we're not sure. We can't be sure. I mean, we used to be sure that the world was, you know, this planet was flat. There are so many things that we used to be sure of, and because 
you couldn't challenge them, a lot of time went by where nothing changed, where we didn't get any smarter. People have been killed for discovering that something that was known to be true, you know, they were researching into it and they came up with evidence that it wasn't true. So they were killed because, you know, some people prefer to just stick with what gives them comfort rather than knowing the truth. So nothing is holy. Nothing should be allowed to be holy. If you can't defend it without appealing to emotion, without going by fear, okay, maybe the one emotion that is okay to appeal to is empathy. If you're saying, you know, these people deserve better, Yes, that is one argument that can, actually. But anger, jealousy, fear, insecurity, no, you cannot use those to justify anything. I mean, this is just one guy's opinion, of course. I hope I don't come off too arrogant here, but ask other skeptics, you know, ask yourself, honestly, doesn't it just make the most sense that one person's emotions, other than empathy, should be allowed to control or justify anything? If it makes sense to do, people will do it, you know, if you don't tell if, if you're not trying to scare people, they will still do stuff that makes sense, you know? To, to all you monotheists out there who are certain that man is weak and must be governed from above with, you know, clenched fist and, you know, the iron fist, what about all those primitive tribes who got by just fine for many, many, many years I mean, the human race is actually fairly old compared to how long one human being lives. People got by quite fine more than 2,000 or 3,000 years ago. They just didn't have your particular brand of religion, you know?